The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe, another catechetical installment from the book A Brief Catechism for Adults by Father William Cogan. And today we're going to be looking at Lesson 11 of the Lesson on Hell, which begins with a citation from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. The Son of Man shall send his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all scandals, and them that work iniquity and shall cast them into the furnace of fire, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verses 41 and 42. And so the section here on uh, hell in the Catechism begins simply with the first question, what is hell? And the answer they give is, the place in the next world where the souls of the damned are condemned to suffer forever with the devils. And they give you a citation from St. John's Gospel, chapter 15. Quote, If anyone abide not in me, he shall be cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. Now, this statement is from our Lord himself, as quoted by St. John in his Gospel. And notice that the references to hell talk about a place where cast-offs go, where there are those who are cast out. It's almost as though it is a kind of uh, refuse uh, pile of creation where those that are unsuitable are simply, well, you might say even discarded. Uh, in fact, even the word Gehenna, which is a, a biblical word applied to uh, hell, uh, has the sense of being a kind of a cast off or a cast away or uh, because it refers, as I understand, to a section uh, near Jerusalem, where, which, which is basically like the town dump, uh, where there was always a fire smoldering, and uh, <clears throat> whatever was, um, was uh, disgusting, and uh, whatever was uh, something that you'd, you'd want to distance yourself from, you, people would take their, their trash, garbage out there and just discard it, in this area of Gehenna, <clears throat> and it became used actually as an idea for uh, hell or what is what is rejected uh, as being kind of the off scouring of uh, of life. So the idea uh, that there are those who are cast out and cast off and sent to a place. Um, for those who uh, simply have uh, failed in their purpose in life. Um, this, this is uh, not far from the meaning of the word Gehenna in the Gospel. So uh, notice what our, our Lord says here also, uh, and, time, uh, and time again in the Gospel. And I understand our Lord refers to hell, not necessarily using the word, but then the word hell uh, is an English word. It came along later. But the concept that we know as hell uh, appears in the gospel 64 times, uh, which is a very substantial number of times that it be explicitly mentioned as a place for those who have been found unacceptable, unsuitable, uh, quite useless, and therefore to be rejected and to be cast out. Uh, number two, how do you know that there is a hell? The answer of the book is, the Bible and tradition often speak of the everlasting punishments of hell. And here, again, we return to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Quote, Then he shall say to them also that shall be on his left hand, Depart from me, you accursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. And these shall go into everlasting punishments but the just into life everlasting. 
And in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, we have our Lord's description of the Last Judgment and the outcome of the Last Judgment, uh, the reward of the just, to whom our Lord says, Come ye blessed of my Father and take possession of the kingdom, and the punishment of the wicked, who are told, Depart from me, ye accursed ones, into the everlasting fire. And so our Lord uh, does speak very clearly of an everlasting punishment. It involves fire and it involves remorse, or a, a eternal regret. Not repentance, but an eternal regret. And uh, number three, who will go to hell? Only those who die with mortal sin on their souls. That is, those who die without the sanctifying grace of God in their souls. You see, the sanctifying grace, as we mentioned before, was the seed of divine life, the divine life of God in the soul. It is a matter of grace. God gives that as a special gift to souls that cooperate with his grace, and notably his actual grace, in order to uh, come to our Lord Jesus Christ, who embrace him by faith and hope and charity, and uh, whom he blesses with uh, a share in his own divine life. And uh, as our Lord said, I came that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So our Lord came to give life where it is not, and then to increase it. And the life that he gives is not just the life of the world, but he gives a supernatural life, a share in God's own life, which we know as sanctifying grace. And uh, those who do not have that sanctifying grace, the life of God in the soul, uh, when they die, leave this world, uh, their souls are separated from their bodies, and their souls appear before the judgment seat of Christ in heaven, or I should say, they appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but uh, those who go to that judgment seat do not, do not have the beatific vision, so they're not, quote-unquote, technically uh, in heaven, uh, but they are judged. And then they can be admitted to heaven if they have perfect love for God and expect, have expiated the sins of their lives. Um, and they can be also condemned forthwith to hell if they do not have the love for God in their soul. And uh, they do not have the divine life or the sanctifying grace in the soul. Or uh, they are pronounced saved, that they have a love for God in the soul, but they have, still have... Uh, still expiation to do for their sins. Um, they have to uh, suffer for the temporal punishment caused uh, by their, the damage caused by their sins in this life. Their life, love for God is lacking in terms of perfection. It is imperfect. They will go to purgatory. But uh, the third question asks, uh, who will go to hell? And the answer is only those who die with Mortal sin in their souls without sanctifying grace will go to hell. And then they, they quote the last book of the Bible, the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 20. Quote, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the pool of fire. And in the book of life we have those who are in the sanctifying grace of God. Number four, does anyone ever get out of hell? The answer is no. Hell is a place of everlasting punishment. And again, we're referred to St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, our Lord's words about the everlasting fires of hell. And we're also referred by the book to the book of the Apocalypse, chapter 14. And the smoke of their torments shall ascend up forever and ever. Neither have they rest day or night. And so you see it as a continual punishment. Now, the fire of hell is a real fire, but it has a special penetrating power. We'll talk about that in a minute. <clears throat> but uh, the fire of hell, the physical torment of hell, uh, sensible torments of hell, are not the only suffering. In fact, that is the, the lesser suffering in hell. The fifth question asks about the pains of hell. What are the pains of hell? Separation from God, torture by fire, regret, and the companionship of devils. And here we turn to the Old Testament book of Job. Quote, Before I go and return no more to a land that is dark and covered with the mist of death, a land of misery and darkness, where the shadow of death and no order but everlasting horror dwelleth. 
Now, in this Old Testament book of Job, it is clearly stated that there is a life after death, but for some, a, a actually a prolonged death, like an everlasting dying. In a, pay, a place of misery, a place of, of uh, despair, and a place of physical uh, torment and anguish. And uh, it would be called perhaps Sheol, or by some other term, um, proper to the Hebrew language. But nonetheless, uh, this concept uh, actually already existed in the Old Testament. Uh, what did not exist in the Old Testament before the coming of Christ was the idea of everlasting life and sharing in the life of God. That's something that our Lord has brought to us. And only He could offer it. Only He could promise it. And only He could give it. And uh, number six, what is the pain of separation from God? The answer is to be separated from God. The source of all love and happiness will be the greatest pain in hell. And here we have a quote from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with the angels of his power in a flame of fire, giving vengeance to them who know not God and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall suffer eternal punishment in destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his power. In other words, it is a place of eternal banishment or everlasting banishment. We can't really call it eternal, strictly speaking, because eternity has no beginning as well as no end. And so, because these sufferings have a beginning, um, they would rather be called everlasting, than strictly speaking, eternal. But nonetheless, in the broad sense of the term, sometimes they're referred to as eternal punishments. But you see, from the... Uh, not only the questions as they are answered by the writer, the author here, but also by the quotations from sacred scripture. There is a regret in hell, a, a great suffering of loss, of, of loss of something wonderful, something great. Um, and the fact that it is one's own fault and that it didn't have to be this way, uh, that one chose this, not only chose the, the horrible place of hell, but actually lost the glory of heaven. There's a sense of tremendous loss in going to hell. Now, perhaps we can get a glimpse of that here on earth. I mean, there are those who actually despair, uh, giving up and sometimes even taking their own lives, because they feel that their lives are utterly pointless and uh, that they serve no purpose. Human beings are created for for a purpose, and they know that. We have an instinctive, a very deep down, down psychological need for purpose. Every day of our lives, we need a good reason to go on. And when we're deprived of purpose, that is the, that is the, the groundwork for despair. Take away purpose, and we just shrivel up and die. Now, um, imagine someone who... Uh, knows, as St. Alphonsus Liguori says he knows, as soon as his soul separates from his body, that God and only God can be his happiness, that God is the purpose of his existence. And he proceeds then, uh, even as some are presenting it today through this tunnel of light, experiencing this great joy, a euphoria as he approaches this beautiful light from which emanates tremendous love. And uh, he experiences that, and then finds our Lord waiting for him in all of his uh, beauty. Now, he's not having the beatific vision yet, but he's merely seeing our Lord glorified. You might say, as the apostles did uh, during the transfiguration. It's a breathtaking sight, fills his soul with wonder and, and joy. And then that soul, from there, is condemned to hell and plunged into hell. We might say, well, only in that case could a soul really appreciate what it has lost. You take the soul of, a, of an inveterate sinner who dies, and you tell him, well, look, you realize that if you die in this state, you'll be banished forever from the sight of God. And such a person might say, good, I've spent my entire life trying to get away from God. Nothing could be better, as far as I'm concerned, than finally making my escape and getting away from God. 
And someone might say that if he didn't know better. Uh, well, he will know better when he dies, as St. Alphonsus Liguori says, he will know that his entire happiness is in God and God alone. That St. Augustine was exactly right when he said uh, so beautifully, O Lord, thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts shall never rest until they rest in thee. So the soul in death knowing this, and if these reports of these so-called uh, uh, near-death experiences uh, where the soul is separating from the body, but it ha the souls do not really separate from the body completely so that they can actually be reunited with the body because the union was not broken. They did not actually die because the soul did not completely separate from the body. But uh, rather they experienced in the process of the soul separating from the body over time, as the church has taught, uh, can happen. Um, they are being drawn to the judgment seat of our Lord and they experience this great joy, then a soul in hell will know the difference. No, no, the, the soul in hell did not experience the beatific vision. The soul in hell cannot really know what it has lost any more than Satan himself, any more than Lucifer, <clears throat> could know exactly what he's lost because Lucifer never had the beatific vision. He's never seen God as the saints <clears throat> and the holy angels see God in heaven. That was the whole point. He didn't pass the test, as it were. So he's never had the beatific vision. So he doesn't really know what he's lost exactly. He just knows it's absolutely unspeakably wonderful. Even for an angel, beyond his power to envision <clears throat> what God is in himself. And that's why St. Peter says that even the devil believes and he trembles with fear, the thought of what he believes, because he does not see God face to face, as the blessed angels and the saints see God face to face. So is so also, as it approaches God for judgment, uh, even though it experiences the joy of being in the presence of Christ and the love of Christ, uh, has not been judged, uh, does not have the beatific vision, but it already is experiencing like a taste of that joy, uh, a foretaste of the joy of heaven, and then for that soul to be plunged into hell and to forever lose that joy, that there's no hope of ever having that again, that it's gone forever because of the decisions that that soul has made. And the soul in judgment will understand what graces God has given to the soul, how patient God has given, how patient God has been in, in the efforts that were made. Uh, above all, our Lord suffering and dying on the cross for that soul. That soul will know all of the actual graces that God has given to it. All of the actual graces, the internal graces, the external graces of, of its life in the world, it will know all of the efforts God has made to save the soul. And it will know one thing. It will know that it is its own fault. And God's mercy is supreme and his justice is infallibly perfect. And with that, the soul will be plunged into darkness forever, into the, into the, the darkness of hell. And um, where there is what our Lord says repeatedly is weeping, that is the regret, that is the sorrow. Not repentance, but repentance would require virtue and love. But this, the soul, like the devil, uh, is filled with bitterness, but it can't escape the realization that it is the cause, it has caused its own fate. And there is a tremendous regret. And um, that is actually the worst of all losses. The sense of the soul that it has completely ruined everything, forever. That the very purpose of its existence, it has, it has completely ruined it. Now maybe in this life, once in a while, we have something happen to us where we worked hard, labored hard for something. It's been very important to us. And then we do something uh, malicious or, or foolish, and we just destroy it. 
And we have this sense of, oh no, oh no, there's no way to repair this. What's done is done forever. There's no way I can regain this. All of the time and effort and sacrifice that are put into this are gone forever. Some of us experience this type of thing in this life already. Even about some simple thing we're working on, a material thing, uh, or money that we've somehow ruined, or lost, uh, through our own fault, um, we experience such a pain of loss for something so trivial. Imagine the pain of loss of a soul in hell that realizes the very purpose of his very existence has been completely obliterated, never to be regained, beyond reparation, uh, beyond recall. And yet the soul must continue like that forever. What a terrible thing. What a terrible, terrible thing. The pain of separation from God. And number six, the question is, what is the pain of separation from God? To be separated from God, the source of all love and happiness. That will be the greatest pain in hell. Now, um, even though we think of the pains of hell of being as being almost like the counterpart of the joys of heaven, they're not. Because the joys of heaven are, one could almost say, infinitely greater than the sufferings of hell. We're impressed by the thought of the sufferings of hell because we can, in a sense, imagine them. We can't imagine the joys of heaven so much. <clears throat> As St. Paul says, uh, it has not entered into the, uh, man has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man what things God has prepared for those who love him. So the human imagination is not capable of really giving us an experience, uh, even, a, even a vicarious experience, of the joys of heaven. Um, there we make an act of faith in our Lord that heaven was so wonderful that he, and he knows what it, what it is, that he was willing to go through all that he suffered to give us the possibility of having it. That, hell is that, that heaven is that wonderful that our Lord would pay such a horrendous price to give us the very possibility of having it for ourselves. How wonderful it must be. We make an act of faith in him that heaven is worth it. No matter what the suffering is, no matter what the sacrifice, heaven is beyond worth it. But uh, we also see in our Lord's sufferings how the horrors of hell and how terrible hell is. But hell is not so terrible that we can't imagine it. The reason why we can't imagine it is because the sufferings of hell, you might say, are not really supernatural sufferings. The joys of heaven are supernatural joys. God has to give us the graces necessary to give our souls the power to have such joy. But God does not have to do something supernatural to the human soul to enable it to experience the sorrows of hell, the pain of loss. So the pains of hell are not supernatural pains. We can actually, in a sense, imagine them. And that's why they have such power. That's why uh, the pains of hell have more power over us often than, than the desire for heaven, which we cannot imagine. We can almost uh, imagine for ourselves the flames of hell licking at our heels, perhaps, uh, because these pains are within our grasp. That's why hell is a very great impetus for those who do not have any love for God or a desire to get to heaven, but nonetheless give God this much, a fear of the Lord and his justice. They may not love God, but they may fear God's justice. And because of that, they believe in hell. They can begin taking the steps away from hell and the steps toward heaven. There's an expression that hell has saved more souls than heaven can ever save. 
because we can think in terms of the sufferings of hell and we can decide, I do not want to go there. How do I escape that pit that is awaiting me because of my sins? If they begin to take the steps, by the grace of God, they recognize it, they acknowledge it, they acknowledge at least God's justice. <clears throat> they give him that much. They can begin backing away from the, the pit of hell. And if they continue to cooperate with the graces of God, calling them away from that pit of hell, they can actually come to the point of finally wisdom in which they really do love God. And they want to see him in heaven. So even the greatest sinners can have the sense to, to fear hell, even if they do not have any love for God. Uh, God actually uses hell to save souls um, and to get them to, get them to heaven. Uh, I talk about the pain of loss as not being a supernatural suffering for us, um, but also the, the pain of sense is not really supernatural because these are pains we can endure here on earth. We, we know what, how fire feels. We can, we can sense the sufferings through the senses, even here in this life, of the type of sufferings there are in hell. One might say, well, but on the other hand, is it not a supernatural that the body should be risen, should rise from the dead, be reunited to a soul and sent to hell to suffer there? Well, um, we are naturally body and soul. Remember, death came in and the dissolution of the body came in because of sin. So when God uh, reverses that effect of, of, uh, of sin, death, reconstitutes the body and reunites it with the soul, that is natural to us, to be body and soul united. So even when the soul is condemned to hell and the body goes with it, again, you know, we could make a, a good argument, that's not a supernatural suffering, as the joy of heaven is a supernatural joy. It can't even be compared in its magnitude. The suffering of hell is nothing in comparison with the joy of heaven. And yet to us it seems so terrible because it's so real to us. And it is real. Heaven knows it is real. Um... Is there a real fire in hell? Yes, Jesus often spoke of the unquenchable fire of hell and says that the damned souls will be, quote, salted with fire. St. Mark chapter 9, which is everlasting fire. St. Matthew chapter 25. <coughs> and here we have again a citation from St. John's Gospel, chapter uh, 15. If anyone abide not in me, he shall be cast forth. Again, we have the expression cast forth as a branch, and shall wither, and they shall gather him up and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. Now, um, a word about that. One might ask, how does a soul, just a soul, suffer this physical torment in hell? I mean, the senses work through the body. The body has a nervous system, and this, uh, the sensations are transferred into the brain. The brain then makes sense out of it, interprets it as pleasure or pain or whatever. And if the body is not there, if the body is left behind and is decaying and the soul goes to hell, how can fire have any effect on a soul? Not only that, but if the angels that fell are pure spirits, they don't have bodies, how can they suffer these torments of hell? And uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, I think, gives us a very good answer about that, at least with regard to the human soul. Now, notice when we talk about devils, we're generally talking about fallen angels. When we talk about lost souls, we're generally talking about demons. Um, and how can a, a lost soul in hell, a demon, uh, without the body, suffer the torments of the fire of hell? St. Thomas says that... In the soul, the human soul, there has to be a foundation for the power of sensation. I mean, but there has to be a correspondence here between the body and the soul. They're, they're designed to be together. So if there's a power of the soul, it is reflected in the body. If there's a power of the body, it is, must be reflected in the soul. And so um, 
the, the, the power uh, to sense, even pain or pleasure, must be somehow rooted in the soul. Um, so what St. Thomas says, uh, if I'm interpreting correctly, is that when the soul is condemned to hell, the soul is actually united with the flame of hell. As though the flame itself were the body, were the body of that soul. As though the flame is united, is, is, is so intimately united with that soul that the flame uh, becomes, it, it becomes as it were the body of that soul there in hell. That's a scary thought. And the soul experiences directly that physical pain, even you know, body, the body being left here on earth. And um, after the resurrection, and the body is refashioned in its horrible way for the condemned, and reunited with the soul, then, then it, it will be the avenue of the suffering, even of the, of the fires of hell. Now, this seems to correspond to various writers about hell and what they've seen in hell. Uh, I think of Our Lady of Fatima showing the children, uh, Lucia, Francesco, and Jacinta, uh, the, he- the, the, the fires of hell, giving them a glimpse of hell uh, during the apparition of July 1917. And uh, Lucia describes what she sees there. The, the ground opened up, and they say, look down into the, into the pit of hell. And she says she saw forms of souls, as it were, uh, in the most baleful signs and, and sounds, uh, sights and sounds, but they were within the flame, being carried about within the flame and buffeted by the flame without any equilibrium, without any control, just completely at the mercy and the, the merciless flames. And the idea of these spirits being somehow united with these flames and f- following the path of the, of the swirling and leaping flames without any control. That's just, again... It certainly frightened the children, but I think it would frighten anybody in any sense. Uh, and there's no doubt, but it was very real to them then, and always remained real, because after that, the children were dedicated to do whatever sacrifices they could to save, hell from, save souls from going there. Um, so, question number eight asks, how does the fire in hell differ from the fire here on earth? And the answer in the book is, the fire in hell burns without consuming and can torture not only the body, but the soul as well. And again, I think St. Thomas Aquinas has given us an understanding of how this can be. Uh, Now we have uh, quotations from uh, a book of the New Testament and the book of the Old Testament. Uh, From St. Mark, chapter 9. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not extinguished. And uh, a little aside on that, the worm dieth not. The worm is the worm of regret that is within, uh, it's a figure of the regret in the soul. Uh, The regret that is like an an all-consuming regret, but it doesn't consume. Um, It's something that would make the soul almost wish to annihilate itself if it could, but it can't. So it doesn't die. There's no escape from it. And the fire is not extinguished. And this refers to the fire of physical torment in hell. And the quotation from the book of Ecclesiasticus, chapter 7, Humble thy spirit very much, for the vengeance on the flesh of the ungodly is fire and worms. And that is from the Old Testament. Again, the concept of the idea of the punishment of the wicked, but the idea of a supernatural life as a reward of the just, No, only our Lord could bring us a knowledge of that. Number nine, what is the pain of regret? The pain of regret means that you will be tortured forever with the thought that you had so many chances to save your soul and be happy with God, but lost heaven because of mortal sin. How how foolish a person, now foolish is a very mild and kind word to use here, but how absolutely foolish a person will feel when he realizes what he has done, what he has traded for everlasting life, the, the absolutely meaningless, useless 
uh, insignificant trifles, a moment's pleasure here and there, a moment's prideful satisfaction here and there, a moment's laziness. I mean, for what? For what? Remind you, remind you of that scene in uh, the movie A Man for All Seasons uh, when uh, I think Paul Schofield as St. Thomas More stops Richard Rich, who just perjured himself to condemn Thomas. And he says, uh, Thomas, uh, he says, uh, Richard, what is that emblem there on your chest? And uh, Thomas is told that Sir Richard has been named the Lord Chancellor of Wales. And with the most, the greatest pathos in his, in his voice, uh, the Thomas More uh, figure says, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? But for Wales, Richard, for Wales. Well, so many souls will be in hell for a lot less than Wales. For a lot less than Wales. What a sad thing. They traded our Lord for 30, Judas traded our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. And there are people who are giving their own, soul, their own souls for a lot less than that. How sad, how tragically sad. When salvation is so readily available, because the mercy of God is so readily available, all it takes is a cooperation with the grace of God that is appealing to us right to the end, right to our last breath. Um, number 10, what is the pain of the companionship of the devils? And the answer, your companions in hell will be the devils and the other lost souls who will always hate you and mock you for being such a fool. And that's the conversation in hell. And so far as there is a conversation, uh, this is what they do. Uh, the souls in hell hate each other. Uh, you know, th there are those in missionary countries uh, who will not accept the faith because they say, I want to be with my ancestors. And if my ancestors were not saved because they worshipped devils or whatever else, then I want to go with them wherever they went. And they, they, they make a tragic mistake because they pretend that they're going to be joined together with them in a love or a fondness or a friendship that they had here on earth. But all they're going to find there is mutual hatred. An absolute bitter hatred. They will despise themselves. They will despise each other. Um, and they will mock and torment each other as much as they can. And that's one of the torments of hell. The sounds of the incessant cries of hatred, just blood-curdling hatred. This is something that those who perform exorcis exorcisms have mentioned. <coughs> that when they confront an evil spirit uh, that has been condemned to hell, the, 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 it's just with a shudder that they, they find themselves... Uh, coming face to face with just such pure malice, with something that hates them, with a, with a furious hatred, a consuming hatred. That's what fills the souls of those who are damned to hell. An absolute hatred for anything that is of God or anything that God made. And they have a special malice for their fellow condemned souls. And the devils, the fallen angels, have nothing but contempt, and they, they want those souls in hell to abuse them forever. Um, as, as, again, another way of, of, of shrieking their triumph over God, so, or so they, they interpret it that way, that they have deprived these souls of heaven forever. Um, and yes, that's what they do. Uh, the fallen souls, the demons, the condemned angels, uh, the devils uh, will be involved in this great conflagration of self-hatred and mutual hatred forever. There's no love there. Those who would not go to heaven because there's somebody on earth that they were attached to and they want to follow them to hell. Well, to say they'll be disappointed is, is really an understatement. They'll be there in, he in hell to hate them with an intense hatred, and to be hated by them forever. No, there, there's no, there's, there's no reason to follow anyone to hell. Uh, there's a quotation here from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. Our Lord says, Then he shall say to them, that's the judge, that's our Lord himself, 
that they shall be that shall be on his left hand. Depart from me, you accursed ones, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. And again, they're accursed. But they're not only cursed by God, they're cursed by themselves and by their fellow accursed spirits forever. You know, though, again, there's a, an account of exorcisms that uh, there's a point in the exorcism which I, I understand that exorcisms follow a certain pattern and the experienced exorcist knows what that pattern is and can actually tell more or less where they are in the process of the exorcism by the devil's uh, tactic, where the, the approach he takes in one stage after another. And one of the stages uh, involves, it seems, hearing what the souls in hell hear. And it's described as this intense cacophony of voices, as though there are millions of voices screaming, shrieking, carrying on, and one can almost understand, but cannot really understand. It's not just static. But they know their voices, and they know they're, they're shrieking certain words. And uh, the first inclination of, a, of someone who hears this is to strain to understand what is being said. But even as they're straining to understand any of those voices, they're focusing on them, listening to them intently to untangle them, and that just draws them in and fills the mind with such confusion and uh, almost uh, like a, a nausea of soul. It's a, it's a terrifying thing to go through, they say, when you go through that part of an exorcism, uh, to hear the sounds of hell. Um, but this, again, is uh, perpetual hatred being expressed in great pain, great suffering, and uh, with absolutely no restraint whatsoever. The sounds of hatred. Number 11, are the pains of hell the same for all? The answer is all the souls in hell will have the same kind of punishments. All will suffer the pain of loss, and all will suffer the pain of sense. But the degree of suffering will differ according to the number and kind of the sins committed. I mean, if, um, if the merits of the souls who have served God well, as our Lord said, even if, you, even if you give as much as a cup of cold water to someone in my name and for my sake, you will not lose your reward. So God rewards every act of love we do for him here on earth. But it also must be said that God punishes every act of, uh, of rejection uh, that we have for him here on earth. And so when we do sin, especially those mortal sins of aversio, adeo, turning away from God, and uh, through our pride setting up some idol to serve us, rather than allowing ourselves to serve God, there will be punishment for that. There will be punishment in hell, everlasting punishment. And um, we know that here on earth, among the wicked, there is a gradation of evil in the, in the evil that they consent to. Uh, there are those who are depraved, and there are those who are completely depraved. Uh, Bishop Sheen actually even made a distinction between those who are bad and those who are evil. He says that uh, those, a bad man, he says, will do bad things. He will do sinful things for the sake of some gain, under the aspect of some good that he thinks he can gain from it. He said that an evil man will do evil to destroy any semblance or any vestige of virtue, notably innocence. He, will, he sets out to destroy virtue, especially the virtue of innocence, in the souls of others. So we know that there are degrees and gradations of this in the soul, depending on how depraved they become. But then we know that among the lost fallen angels, there was a hierarchy also, a hierarchy of will, a hierarchy of malice to which they subscribed, and a hierarchy of evil to which they consented. And so there is a hierarchy among the devils in hell. There will be a hierarchy also among the demons, the fallen human souls, 
But again, by virtue of the angel's greater natural powers of intellect and will, the fallen angels in hell will lord it over, uh, excuse the expression, but will lord it over the human souls who will be at their horrible unmercy, unmercifulness. Um, as so many trophies to uh, devour without consuming. Um, C.S. Lewis portrays this very nicely in Screwtape Proposed a Toast, very nicely, I mean, it's horrific, but in Screwtape Proposes a Toast at the end of the Screwtape Letters. Um, talks about the devils, the fallen spirits in hell, feasting on the souls, the condemned souls of men. So, again, uh, the pains of hell are the same kind, but they will be uh, greater pains and greater sufferings for those who've cr uh, whose malice is greater, whose evil is greater. And the greatest suffering in hell belongs to Lucifer. He suffers the greatest. He has the greatest even natural capacity for suffering. Um, and he takes it out on everyone else, unfortunately. They're there because they have proclaimed him their Lord by sinning. And insofar as they've given him their obedience, insofar as they've given Satan, Lucifer, their allegiance, well, they'll have him for their Lord, all right, for, forever. Now they have some practical points here. Number one, think often of hell and the possibility of your going there. Pray every day that you will not die with mortal sin on your soul. Say the act of contrition every night. That's very good advice. One of the problems we have, I'm afraid, is that we, we don't really take to heart the, the, the real possibility that we could be condemned to hell. Uh, we need to face that. We really need to face that fact. No one is immune from this. I mean, even St. Paul, after, after St. Paul the Apostle, had made so many sacrifices, as we read in the Gospels. He talks about the times he was, he suffered uh, being stoned to death and left, left uh, uh, poor dead. He was beaten with rods, he was scourged with the whips, he suffered shipwreck, he, he suffered hunger and thirst and heat, and cold, fatigue, dangers constantly. His entire life, it seems, was one great Adventure, but it was an adventure of love for God that enabled him to brave all of these, all of these privations, all of these threats. And yet, after all was all of this was done, he said he himself could become a castaway. After all that, he could become a castaway, and even his choice of words there reminds us of what our Lord said about being cast out, being cast out. This is what St. Paul is talking about. He says it was possible that he himself, in the end, could be cast out if he proved to be unfaithful. Not that he would lose faith. He says, Lest I, when I, after I preach to others, I myself should become a castaway. He's talking about failing our Lord. And perhaps uh, the sting of the flesh that was visited, visited upon St. Paul was there to keep him humble, so that he, St. Paul, knowing how much he'd suffered and how much he'd accomplished for Christ, would be kind of immunized against taking credit for it and becoming proud of it. Because the moment he allowed himself to take credit for any of the good he'd done, the moment he allowed himself to become proud for all of the things he suffered for our Lord, how much more than anyone else of those that he had brought to the faith. Did he suffer? Well, that posed a danger for him to take credit for that. And he knew that the moment he did, he would lose it all. He would lose it all. He would lose the merit for it all. He would lose the benefit of it all for his own soul. He would take the glory from God and appropriate it to himself. And Paul would once again have returned to Saul the Pharisee. And he knew he was in danger. So if, if St. Paul talked about the danger of himself becoming a castaway and losing his soul after all that he had done, 
Do we actually think for a moment that we are somehow exempt from that? That that is no danger to us? The one in greatest danger of going to hell is the one who thinks that he's the safest. And that's, that's presumption. That's a sin against the Holy Ghost. That's presumption. There are those who think there's no way I could ever get to heaven. There's no way I can ever be saved. That's despair. But it's, again, evil sister sin is presumption. And that's what the next point is. Presumption is the sin committed by people who think that a good God will not punish a sinner with the torments of hell. God, being a just judge, has to reject those who choose to separate themselves from him by mortal sin. So notice that this point is that God has to, has to do this. And I mean, when you think about it, uh, yes, he created the, the angelic spirits with free will to choose freely him or not, or to for him or against him. And the spirits who followed Lucifer were so enamored of themselves and so enamored of him that they chose to try to be their own gods. Exactly the temptation that Lucifer would later use on Eve. It was a temptation that he himself had fallen to, saying, I'm self-sufficient. I don't need God to be my happiness. I can be my own happiness. I can be my own purpose of existence. And so uh, he fell. And uh, what does God do, though, after having created uh, intelligent beings with free will, and some, because they're not infinite goodness, but because they are creatures, they are defectible. They can go bad. And some did. What is he to do with them? Is he to force them to stand in his presence in heaven forever at that point? Remember what the demons who are being exercised told Father Amort, we suffer more here than we do in hell, than we would in hell. Because there they are meant to confront what is holy. Imagine if one of those demons were forced to stand before God forever and can be confronted with that holiness, um, which they had be betrayed. That would be, that would be supernatural suffering. That would be, that would be terrible. Uh, would a soul deserve that? Well, yeah, strictly speaking, I guess that's what it would deserve. And so, even when God punishes souls in hell, he doesn't even begin to give the soul what it actually deserves, you know. But, uh, but he doesn't force that. He has created a place for those souls that are the off-scouring of creation to go. He's made a place for them. And even though it's a, pain, it's a place of suffering and loss, it's actually in itself a place of great mercy because the souls actually deserve so much worse, so much worse than that. And they know it too. And that's another thing that adds to the suffering is that they know it. That even there, God is merciful to them. Now, number three, and the last point here, is the horror of hell helps us understand the evil of mortal sin. Mortal sin is the greatest evil in the universe. And uh, again, I mean, this is a spiritual suicide, uh, and, and no one can murder your soul but you. I mean, you're the one who has to decide whether you're going to join Lucifer in his rebellion. No one can deify you. Uh, and hurt you thereby, except you yourself. Um, no one can drive the life of sanctifying grace in your, out of your soul, but you, by the choice that you make. And that's why Father Amorth, the exorcist in Rome, says, the worst thing that the devil can do to you is not possess you, it's not oppress you, it's not obsess you, it's to tempt you. Because by tempting you, he's inviting you to join him in his guilt, in his revolt, and finally, it is condemnation and in hell by your own choice. And that's a choice no one else can make for you. You, you have to choose that. So uh, it's exactly right what they say here to recognize that mortal sin is the worst of all evils because it is spiritual suicide. Um, 
And uh, by the grace of God, uh, I, I pray for each and every one of you who hears this, that you will never, ever, ever fall into that. Um, but we'll, we'll always turn to the mercy of God with all your heart and soul and humbly repent of sins and beg God's forgiveness. Uh, find the path of the true faith that God has given to us. Avail yourself of the blessings of the sacrament of penance. Receive absolution for your sins. And consider that to be the most important thing in your life if you are in the state of mortal sin. Uh, God is prompting you by his grace. You know, after we fall into mortal sin, God calls us to him to receive his forgiveness. When we find that voice of conscience in us after we've fallen into mortal sin, to think of going to confession, that's not just us thinking about spontaneously, well, gee, maybe I should go to confession. That's the voice of our Lord by actual grace calling us to him, saying, come to me, all you are, are burdened, and I will refresh you. Come to me, all of you who have lost the grace of God, sanctifying grace, the divine life in your soul, and I will restore that to you. Come to me humbly, learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. What else does one have to learn in order to repent? Meekness and humility of heart. Come to me, our Lord says. Learn from me, repent of your sins, and I will forgive you. Uh, is that something that our Lord wants to do? He died to do it. He paid a great price to make forgiveness possible. And not only to make forgiveness possible from God the Father, but to even enable us to seek forgiveness. It requires His suffering and the graces that came from it. Even to enable us to humble ourselves, to want to be forgiven, and to escape hell, and to finally see him in heaven. That's how much our Lord loves us. That's how much our Lord loves us. That's how great his mercy is. So we must always have that confidence. Uh, no matter how lowly we may feel, uh, even if we may be tempted to be another Judas, and say, oh, I'll just go off and end it all, because now I've ruined everything and there's no hope for me. Even if we be tempted that way, we'll never give in to that temptation. But we'll always, always, always do as Peter did and run to, that, run to the tomb on Easter Sunday morning. And there, before that day is out, find our Lord and face Him with a humble and contrite spirit and receive His mercy, His forgiveness and a restoration of the divine life of sanctifying grace. May God bless you all.